Hello world of YouTube and welcome to my listening log update for October of 2018. Before I get into the records that I got to this month, I just want to thank everybody for the support of No Signal during its first month of release. Um, I had a lot of reviews come out and a lot of you guys really seem to enjoy it and that means the world to me. I got a couple of music videos I want to shoot for the album. I wanted to get one out before the end of the month and that just didn't happen. So I'm going to have one come out next month and then the other one come out either late December, early January. Um, they're good for the songs Lofty Rains and the title track No Signal. Thank you again for the continued support. Like I said, I got 16 albums to cover this month. I have 16 albums to get to today, so I didn't want to take up a whole lot of time in this preamble for the before the rest of the talk, but I seriously wanted to thank every single one of you who've listened to the album. If you haven't listened to it yet, it'll be linked in the description and it's on the channel, so there's that. A handful of requests were done and a lot of current stuff. I tried to focus a lot on the shit that came out in October because a lot dropped, so I tried to get a balance of that. Um, so yeah, let's just get into it. First album I checked out this month was actually the latest ghost-faced killer record, The Lost Tapes, which I enjoyed and I and I think that it, it meets that kind of consistency that Ghostface aims for. And I don't mind that there's a lot of features on this album, but I wish that there one were better features and two there was just a little more to this i don't mind the features because ghostface came from a conglomerate you know he's used to sharing the stage with a lot of folks so i don't mind him having a record with a lot of that but i think that a majority of these features don't really do anything for me the raekwon feature is nice i wish he had more raekwon on this record and honestly kind of reminds me of the better parts of Raekwon's most recent record, which had some tracks that really harkened back to that Wu-Tang style that he's known for, but also had some shit that was chasing the pop trends. This doesn't do that. This stays purely old-school hip-hop. I mean, he's got Big Daddy Kane on one of these fucking songs. So this is old-school through and through, that East Coast boom-bap shit, and it's got Ghostface being Ghostface, but I feel like the features he chose aren't as consistent as Ghostface on this project. I'm honestly surprised Capadonna impresses me as much as he does on this record though. Like he's flexing more than he needs to. Honestly, the track Buckingham Palace ain't bad. I mean, you got King Crooked. I mean, Crooked Eye is one of those dudes that he's either gonna kill it or just kind of coast and he doesn't coast on this. It's it's pretty all right. Watch Him Holla feels like a half-assed Wu-Tang reunion, but I don't mind that because anytime I get those dudes together, some magic happens and it happens on Watch Em Holla. Even the track with uh, Snoop Dogg and E-40, it's pretty good. It's, it's, there's, there's pieces of this puzzle that work really, really well and much love to Michael Rappaport. You could tell he's a huge fan of Ghostface Killa and he, he geeked out a little bit on this, but I don't blame him being a huge Ghostface fan myself. It's just mad and consistent. It's, it's got some good tracks, it's got some good features, but not quite enough to make it a truly ex excellent record. I give it a seven out of 10. So the second album I checked out was one of my most anticipated records of the year, the Black Queen's second album, Infinite Games, follow-up to the 2016 record, Fever Daydream, which was one of my favorite albums of that year. For those who don't know who these guys are, they're the new band for former Dillinger Escape Plan frontman, Greg Pucciato. They're in a band that's very inspired by 80s synth pop and new romantic stuff, very percussive sounds, very driving soundscapes, and there's some tracks they usually dabble in some more modern idiosyncrasies, and they meld the two atmospheres really well together. And I really fucking like this follow-up. Uh, I, I like the fact that they double down on more of the 80s sound. Not that the, the modern sounds are vacant tracks like Your Move with its very airy atmosphere and breathy vocals fit in very well with the very dreary soundscape that coats a lot of modern music. But I like that there's still a lot of energy present on tracks like No Accusations, which has a fucking killer bass Line, with tracks like Thrown Into the Dark and Spatial Boundaries having these very just, again, throwback dance style sounds that sound like they're lifted straight out of a Depeche Mode record. The lyrics on this thing are also very 
romantic. There's a lot of romantic confessions delved into. You know, lots of, you were my everything, I would die for you, let's lay in the dark type lyrics. And it fits the soundscape they're working with. I think this thing is as good as their debut. I think the only thing that holds this thing back from being any better than it are some of these songs go on for just a little too long. This album feels so elongated in some instances. Like the first track thrown into the dark. It, it goes on for like two minutes too long. There's a point where on a couple of these tracks where I've reached a point where I feel like it should have ended, but I'm only like a third of the way through the song or halfway through the song. And it's, it's a problem. I feel like if they tighten things up, kept the songwriting and kept the sounds, they could make a better record. They just, they're, they're, slowly working their way toward that I feel they've harnessed their soundscape a little better they just have to tighten things up a little more as far as their composition and their pacing goes and I think they have a, an excellent record on their hands I give this thing like an 8 out of 10 really good listen probably gonna sleep under a lot of radars this year and I really want to suggest listening to them listen to this album and their first one they pair really well together <laughs> We got the new Coheed and Cambria album, Vaxis Act 1, The Unearthly Creatures, which, if you couldn't tell by that title, really dives back into their science fiction themes, and it fits into the grand narrative that Claudio has spent almost two decades crafting. I love this band. I'm, I'm an adamant defender of them. I like their albums a lot. I even like this album, but I do feel like they need to just find something new to write about. And my criticisms are not gonna reflect my score, but that's because I'm a Coheed listener who finds a lot of the broad relatability within their lyrics. It's present on In Keeping Secrets, it's present on From Fear Through the Eyes of Madness, it's even present on You're the Black Rainbow, which is my favorite Coheed and Cambria album. It's here! You know, it tracks like Queen of the Dark, uh, Unheavenly Creatures, all have these sound, these lyrics and these refrains that are <clears throat> very relatable, even if they do tie into the story, but those are few and far between. I feel like they need to just make more albums like their previous one. I like whenever they make records that are a little more relatable. You know, they, they show a more humanistic side. I know that's not their shtick, but I feel like it would work really well for these guys to write more records like that or focus on keeping the concept but making it not inaccessible. I feel like they do achieve with this record by striking a better balance between the grander concepts and the more broadly relatable lyrics and I think that helps given that this is a new chapter in that saga. I like a lot of the sounds. I like that this thing almost bridges a gap between In Keeping Secrets of Silent Earth 3 and From Fear Through the Eyes of Madness really, really well. It blends those elements with that record. It has the very big anthemic rock sounds that I look for in this band, but I feel like they're gonna start losing people that aren't interested in this story. That's upsetting because these guys, Claudio knows how to write a really good song. He just buries it in a lot of storytelling. Tracks like, even tracks like Toys, and nighttime walkers. I get the imagery, I get the ideas, and they don't push me away. But I know that they're tied to a grander concept that I have vague interest in. Um, I'm not losing hope on them. I'm still gonna stick around, keep listening for their new stuff. But that's because I give this album an eight out of 10. But I know they're on that cusp of losing some people. Which they might not care about, but I know that there's very few fans like me in the Coheed fandom. <laughs> And the next album was a request from Random Rock and Real Rhythm Reviews. It's the newest record from Forming the Void, Rift. Now, I'd never heard of these guys, but he pitched them as this kind of stoner, sludgy metal band in the vein of Mastodon. And I kind of hear that, but I more hear Baroness. Their vocals are a little more akin to Baroness's very gravelly, but harmonizable voice. Um, their sounds on their guitars remind me more of stuff on like Blue by Baroness. But that's not a bad thing. I really liked this album. I thought it sounded really great. I'm a sucker for this sound. This is one of those things that just, it, it 
ticks some buttons that I really, really like. And there's other bands in this genre that do this style that I've listened to that aren't as gratifying to listen to as these guys are. I really like the refrains and the epic moments on On We Sail and Arrival. I think these guys don't get too caught up in their own hubris. I think they write really tight songs. They don't get lost in a concept and they're just a really good solid rock band to check out if you like the sort of sound. If you like thicker guitars, if you like really thunderous drums, and you like vocals that just demolish over the mix, you're gonna like these guys. They do a really good job at keeping it packaged, very accessible. Lyrics are filled with all this grand imagery about netherworld and drowning and monolithic beings, but it's not lost in a high concept. The, the longest song in the album is the last one, and it's an anthemic closer. It's got, it aims for the nosebleeds, and I feel like it hits it on mark pretty well. Um, I give this thing like a seven out of 10, Really fantastic, solid record. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, I like stuff like this, and this ticks boxes for me more than other bands in the genre do. This is a joke. And this is so sad. Some continuity errors between the last part and this part. I, while editing, I didn't like my review of this, so I'm just going to reshoot it. The next time I checked out was the album Hypochondriac by the uh, band The Frights. Requested by fellow musician from Fully Involved, Mark from the Mad Sounds channel, the Honky Chat podcast, friend of mine, good old buddy pal. Um, he's talked about these guys uh, here and there when we were doing the Mad Sounds podcast together. Um, he's interviewed these guys, he knows the guys, and uh, he's, he's shown me some of their stuff, and I, I dig their stuff what I've heard in passing, but this is the first album I've really given a full chance, and I enjoyed this thing. They've got this kind of California pop indie rock sound with a punk edge and a couple of songs, and I like the balance they strike. They use some synthesizer tones and some production choices to make their sound a little more unsettling, and it fits definitely some of the lyrical themes on this album. Abandoning all previous ideals, growing old, uh, like on tracks like Me, We, and I. Um, seeking some sort of validation from your peers, like on whatever, but getting fed up with the, the conquest of that, you know, uh, having an addiction to uh, medication that you're put on that you don't want to be a part of anymore, like on crutch, you want to abandon your vices. Uh, this, is, this is a really solid record. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this thing. Um, I think their vocalist has this really nice mix of Brendan Flowers and Rivers Cuomo. Uh, it really taps into that style that they're aiming for, and his delivery in its unsettled nature really matches the lyrical themes as well. They just really wrote some choice songs, and they were really smart with how they put them together. I thoroughly enjoyed this thing. Um, if you like that sort of indie, California, pop rock, punk edge stuff, uh, you'll enjoy this. It's got a lot of different ideas sonically in the pot under those umbrellas, but they all fit together really well. I give this thing like a 7 out of 10. Thank you, Mark, for the suggestion, and this is a much better review than what I originally filmed. Dropping all the things that they no longer need to. Now, this album was another one that I was really looking forward to, the new Cara Cara Bonita album, Time and Place. And I liked uh, Benito Generation, it was on my top 50 of 2016, and this album is a bit of a shift in style, but not one that I hate by any stretch of the imagination. They don't lose any of the sugary pop stuff, they just drown it in more noise and odder vignettes sonically than what was present on their previous record. It sounds less like they're trapped in a Sega Dreamcast and more like they're trapped in a noise pedal. It's having sex with a Casio. I think the album is paced in a really weird way. A lot of these songs end in these kind of rough sounding gritty noises that they use to transition into some of these songs and they're fine. They just feel a little out of place at times. Um, this isn't what I was expecting whatsoever, but I did genuinely enjoy my time with this thing. Still littered with tracks like Dear Future Self, Dump, and Only Acting that are really sugary and catchy with really catchy synth lines. Only it has shit like Fly Away and Visiting Hours that are a little less accessible. They're a little dirtier, and I like that a lot. Um, and the Closer Rest Stop actually closes things out in a really charming way. 
there's a lot of charm still present from Caro uh, from Benito Generation. It's just spun through a different funnel. I know that this isn't exactly what a lot of people were expecting, but I hope other people are walking away liking this thing as much as I am. I honestly think if you didn't like the overly sugary sound of Benito Generation, you're gonna like the dirtier mix in this a little more. I give it like an 8 out of 10. It's a charming little, rele little release. Um, in the same vein as their first album, just in a different prism. <laughs> My buddy Austin suggested the new George Clanton album, Slide, and I'll tell you this, it's a fantastic album to slide into fall with. This is a kind of a synth pop chill wave sort of record. There's a lot of those tones that are present in chill wave. They're just a very, they're even a more of a lo-fi sort of ordeal. Um, lots of smooth dance beats with some chill vocals over them. A really fantastic record that I feel like uh, feels fresh in the genre of Chill Wave especially. I really love tracks like Blast Off that set me into a mood that just I can wash away into. This is an album that after listening to the first time I threw on the background countless times throughout the month. It was one of those albums that I kept revisiting because I love the piano tones. I love the drums. I love the rhythms that this album locks into and it feels really loose and free. It's almost like a melding of big beat from the early 90s stuff like boom boom satellites but through a lo-fi prism. It's totally up my alley electronically and I fucking like this thing. The one moment that I feel like can, can epitomize my feelings of bliss with the record is on the track Make It Forever with the really icy synths that start the track and there's a drop that happens when the beat comes in and it just, it feels so fucking good. It was a great dose of serenity that I needed this year. Um, I give it like a 9 out of 10. It's a really smooth listen. It's one of my favorites for sure. Thank you, Austin, for the suggestion. I I love this thing. And the last request I got to this month is Carnation's Chapel of Abhorrence. Requested by my buddy Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Really old school sounding death metal release. Uh, reminds me of some shit that like Morbid Angel was doing a couple years back. It's very throwback sonically as far as like its composition and how it's arranged but has those modern death metal production tropes. It's a pretty solid release. Lots of lyrics about the macabre and death and grimness. Especially at its title track. Its title track is fucking vicious. It's fucking visceral. Also with Magnum Chaos. Magnum Chaos has this section in it where everything just blows you down. It's all about grinding you into a pulp. It, it It's one of those albums that I have to listen to if I'm in the mood to, to throw on some old school style uh, death metal, but it fit the theme of the month. You know, it had some spooky, had some macabre, had some death style lyrics. Um, it just got a little tropish as I continued to listen to it. You know, the, the blast beats and everything like that felt fitting, but I would have liked to have seen utilizations of other styles in the genre of death metal. I like this thing, but I could see some improvements that could be made within it. Still a great experience. If you like old school style death metal, you'll enjoy this record. It's one of those that definitely fits the season. So if you're wanting some post Halloween, spooky, grim music, throw this on. Uh, if you're a fan of old school death metal, I give it like a seven out of 10. Really good stuff. Thank you for the suggestion, Kyle. When we this is probably the farthest I can get from a generic death metal record, but the newest Death Cab record did absolutely nothing for me. Uh, it bored the shit out of me, frankly. There was a lot on here that just went nowhere. Like, the only, the only points I could really highlight is I like some of the sounds in the opening track and 60 and punk was a decent closer but outside of that and when we drive this record is just buried in a lot of similar sounding drab tracks like the only thing that saves this record from being any worse is that it flies by its runtime pretty quickly very little of this record sits with you uh, I could listen to this record probably five more times and not 
remember most of what I listened to. A lot of the guitar sounds are just dull. I think this record gets better when it's less rockish, uh, which is weird for Death Cab, but my favorite moments on the record are when it tones down a lot of the jangly guitars and focuses more on a different type of tone, and even that, it's not great, but it's at least different. I give it like a 4 out of 10, only because it didn't actually put me to sleep. Holly there, cause you was always leaving. Field museum, planetarium, aquarium, you saw some- I've been a Lupe Fiasco fan for a long time. Uh, I've talked about him on the channel like a long time ago. I'm like a lot of people, I like his first two records. I like some of his mixtapes. Um, but I think he ha he's overall had a very spotty discography. His mixtape that dropped last year, Drogas Light, didn't do anything for me. Didn't do much for me anyway. Um, it was no Tetsuo in youth. So I had fears going into Drogas Wave. But this record's really fucking good. Like, when I saw that Lupe Fiasco did an hour-long record, I was terrified because I was assuming it was Drogas uh, Light levels of bad, given it shares a name with that. But he dives into some high conceptual shit, and I respect the fuck out of it. I mean, the first, like, five, six tracks work really well together. Um, and while he loses that, he keeps it pretty consistent as far as the lyrical topics he delves into goes. Like, he talks about some really hefty concepts in a sincere way, like on Joni La Forever, where he talks about the, the kid that was shot dead in Chicago. What would happen if they grew up older? He On King Nas, he raps about his nephews get, growing into men. Really prolific stuff that he's known for with the same heart and passion that I came to him for initially. I respect Lupe a lot for being bold with this record, for throwing convention for throwing convention out the window as far as structuring it goes. A lot of the interludes on here don't feel like they fit a lot of the record, but they sound nice. Um, I like that he's still trying to be as forward-thinking as he used to be. Lupe feels a little more at home on this record. It's a, it's a better follow-up to Tetsuo in Youth than Drogas Light was. Very few lulls. What lulls I have here are the tracks that are a little more misfired, like XO. I like the idea of a track like Down, but I feel like it misses the mark just a little bit. And there's a couple of tracks like that on here. But again, overall, good record. Not gonna be one of my favorites of the year, but I'm glad that Lupe made another really good record. I give this thing like a 7 out of 10. If you like Lupe Fiasco and you want him to be more high concept, you're probably going to get a little a little more out of this record than I did. Uh, if, if Lupe doubled down on the concept and made it a full experience outside of whatever, whatever bullshit he's talking about, because Lupe likes to backpedal a lot when it comes to covering his own ass, you may like this thing. Um, I would like this thing more if that was the, if that was the case. I hope that he continues down this path and stops making really shitty music. So as you guys saw with my review of the movie, I really liked it. And I really liked the soundtrack as well. John Carpenter and his son fucking got it. I mean, it's John Carpenter. The dude makes some of the most iconic film music known in its respective genres and in here he continues that you know the little the little musical cues he gave to certain characters in the movie like for the for the granddaughter and stuff they 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 fit in with the stuff that's in the other the first halloween movie this feels like a really good sister record to that the theme's great happy it's here Lori's theme is good there's, there's some just good classic style horror synth here. Um, if you like that kind of stuff, you'll like this. Uh, I take a lot of influence from John Carpenter personally, and I like that he still got it. You know, I've liked his solo records that he's put out the last couple of years, and I'm glad that his actual film scores are still as good. They're still ominous. They're still creepy. They still have these nice stings, these kind of staccatos that really help build the tension more. He's good at that, and he... he, he him and his son really showcase that in spades all over this thing. I give it like an 8 out of 10. It's a really good score, guys. I mean, 
If you like horror scores, this is going to do a lot for you. If you've seen the movie, you probably like the music. If you haven't seen the movie, go see it. The soundtrack doesn't work as well as, as on its own as other soundtracks that I've listened to over the past couple of years do, but it's still some really good creepy music. I listened to this record because it was Halloween season, and I feel like if I was going to discuss this this year, this would be the time to do it. Ice Nine Kills' latest record, The Silver Scream, is about scary movies. And if you couldn't tell by my list I dropped two days ago, I like scary movies. And do I think this thing is great? Yeah, it, it's okay. It, it, it nails the mark on the head sometimes, but I feel like it misses the mark more often than not. It just sounds like very generic metal core, which isn't my thing. Um, where I think this thing works is when it tries to emulate some of the stuff from the movies. Stabbing in the Dark has the section that does the stings from the Halloween score as a breakdown. That's pretty fucking nice! The Jig is Up has sections where a jigsaw-like person is giving a monologue. That works! Uh, the tr last track, It is the End works given its its additional arrangements that that enhances the macabre feel of the album but tracks like savages and a little bit on the american nightmare the american nightmare is a weird hybrid of the the things i like and don't like because it has stuff that fits in with Night the nightmare on elm street but it also has these really poppy sounding choruses that i wouldn't want on an album about halloween stuff but that's just me. I'd probably eaten this shit up like 10 years ago. I feel like Enjoy Your Sleigh was the biggest missed potential because if you guys didn't see, The Shining is on my favorite film list, favorite horror films list, and this is just a generic sounding metalcore song. It does not do much for me. The worst song on this album is probably Freak Flag. That does not sound anything. Like, I can get glimpses of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in very small doses on Savages, but it's it's buried under this mediocre sound. Freak Flag has just a, it's just an anthem song, and it, it kind of breaks the concept, as does uh, the song about Edward Scissorhands, because that does not make me think of Halloween. I love Edward Scissorhands. It's one of my favorite Tim Burton movies, but it does not belong here, personally. With that in mind, I give it like a 6 out of 10. It's not bad. Could be better. If you want a good spooky metal album, listen to Horror Show by Iced Earth, because it's a little more focused than this. Trench. An album that the internet has a myriad of opinions about. Some love it. Some think it's just okay. I kind of sit in the middle. I am a I'm not the biggest 21 Pilots fan. I think they're okay. I don't think they're anything special. And that's what a lot of their fan base thinks. They're this special little nugget. When they're just an alternative hip-hop band that broke into the indie scene as opposed to the hip-hop scene because they're signed to a pop-punk label. I think their two albums with them as a duo are okay. I'm not the biggest fan of Blurry Face. I think it's a little too reggae-infused. Um, Vessel's all right. This album, I like a little more than Vessel, if only because it's like a Coheed and Cambria album. It's got a high concept, and that's kind of neat. And I like the ideas that Tyler puts into this album lyrically. It's a little easier to follow than a Coheed and Cambria record, but I think it's because the concept isn't rooted in space and wizards and cannons and weird shit. It's, it's based in very relatable topics and ideas because that's what Tyler wanted to do. People can connect with a song like Jumpsuit or um, Neon Gravestones because the topics are a little more the concepts are a little more out there. They're a little more upfront. They're not reserved behind a bunch. They're not protected behind a bunch of allegories, which I like. I don't mind that. I think the performances are a little tighter as well. Tyler's rapping is on fucking point. Josh's drumming has always been something that I've enjoyed about the band, and it feels like a tighter package than Blurry Face was. 
So I like this thing a little more than your average 21 Pilots record, but not by much. I feel like 21 Pilots fans are going to enjoy it. As a m person who doesn't think they're the worst thing on Earth, it's all right. I give it like a 7 out of 10. It's pretty solid. Um, they're just not a band that I wholly love, but I enjoyed this for at least the effort they put into it. And I think it paid off for them a lot better than other bands writing a concept album. The, the next two records weren't originally on my list to get to this month, but I felt like I needed to talk about them now before they became irrelevant to talk about. And Greta Van Fleet's album, Anthems, Anthems of the Peaceful Army, is the solidification of that. Everyone's been shitting on their music. I'm not a fan of it either. Not because I hate rock music, but I feel like this isn't what rock music needs anymore. You know, shit in like 2008, when like Black Tide was trying to be the new Iron Maiden. That wasn't really needed, but it, it made a little more sense then. Given where rock music is in 2018, we really don't need stuff like this. People who say rock is dead don't follow rock music, truly. Um, there's a lot of bands doing cool shit that don't sound like blatant ripoffs of the better bands of the genre. I think these guys are capable players, but this is just bad. This is just, and it's bad because it's so unoriginal. It sounds so much like a product. This sounds like a Hollywood producer remaking something, trying to please the fans when they don't understand what the fans like about that product to begin with. I, this thing is a one, but not because it's terrible, because it has no character. It has no depth. It's the kid's little wading pool. They could make a better album than this though. You know, I've said in the past that bands sometimes rest on their influences a little too heavily. This is the hyperbole of that, you know? Even even on, like, my record, y'all could tell where my influences were, but I tried to adapt them, and that's all I'm saying, is you can have your influences, but don't just make a carbon copy of that, man. Come inside with me and you can be mine as well. And I and it just didn't stop with the new Disturbed, and I'm only listening to this purely because I used to listen to these guys. You know, I've seen them live multiple times. I wasn't expecting much from this, and I walked away about where I was expecting it to be. I didn't like their comeback a few years ago because it sounded like half-ass Disturbed with really abhorrent lyrics, so I understand the need for change. They say it's a change, and the only change is that they added more dad ballads. This sounds so unlike them, but in all of the wrong ways. I would have enjoyed if they really tried to branch out, but tracks like Are You Ready, Savior of Nothing, just sound like disturbed through the funnel of incredibly generic alt metal it doesn't have the characteristics of a disturbed album instead that is swapped out with a void of gray the only difference is they added tracks like watch you burn and a reason to fight that are ballads they coded this thing in ballads and that's fine the only merits that set it above a one are the drum solos. They have drum solos, and I respect a good drum solo. The best one being on Savior of Nothing. Gets a two out of ten. That's about it. All we got is ourselves and these mouths to feed and those keys on your belt that held you down. And Closing out the, the month with an album that I was hoping to like, the new Atmosphere record, Mi Vida Local. Now, I'm an Atmosphere fan since late high school, early college. That same friend that gave me the Wu-Tang albums, he gave me a handful of Atmosphere projects and the shit he did with MERS. And I'll admit, I've mostly been following this saga of Slug purely because I'm curious to see if he's going to make anything worth noting after being a dad. Ever since A Family Sign came out, Atmosphere got a lot less interesting. And I'm not knocking him for that. He's a dad now, he's got dad things to do, so he makes dad rap. They've never made a bad album, they've just purely been writing their own passable plateau. And I've been hoping that they would exceed that with some record, and I feel like they did on Me Vita Local. This is why I follow bands that I've listened to for a long time, even if they haven't been making albums that I would say that I absolutely love, 
in a while. What I like about this is he gets very sincere with how he feels his life as a father with his baby mama. Tracks like Trim, he just wants to fuck, but he can't because his kids are always fucking around. I get that stress. I get that struggle. I don't have a kid, but I've dated women with kids. You know, tracks like Drown are just good hip hop cuts and Randy, Randy Mosh has a great dynamic in it. This feels very lively. I didn't hate Fishing Blues. I give it a six out of 10 if I'm not mistaken, but this is a step up from that. You know, it's got the shit like Virgo and Jerome, which are a little more blues guitar infused, which is fine. But Slug talks about shit that I wanna hear on this album. It feels more akin to golden age atmosphere you know he still wants to be there for his kids you know he talks about that on Miho, but he talks about the stresses of being a father too he i like that this album explores a lot more dynamics with the family than your average album about the family <clears throat> ant provides a good backbeat for him as always this thing was a great album to cap this month off with because i had listened to some really shitty shit over the last couple of weeks i gave it a seven out of ten it's a good record. It's a, it's a better atmosphere record than I was than I was honestly expecting. Um, and if you're an atmosphere fan, you're probably gonna like this record. Uh, and that's been the month. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I'm gonna try and trim it down because it's a little long as I'm looking at the runtime. Um, I still have some requests in the docket. If you have any requests, feel free to leave them in the the comments down below. As far as the end of the year goes, I'm not cutting things off in December. I'm cutting things off uh, in the beginning of January beginning of January is when list season is going to start for me so feel free to suggest records for December as well I'm gonna go <clears throat> I have been viral back you guys have good ideas last situations thank you again for all the support you've given me and I'll see you another day